This is Calvary Church with Skip Isaac. We're so glad you've joined us today. Whether or not you follow the news, there's no question we're accelerating towards the end times. There's also no question that God is in complete control. But are prophecies actually being fulfilled in our lifetime? In this message, Pastor Skip takes a close look at events like the Abraham Accords, COVID-19, and the Russia-Ukraine conflict through the lens of biblical prophecy. Here's Pastor Skip. Uh, turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. Luke, chapter 21. So, Sherlock Holmes went camping with his faithful associate, Dr. Watson. They fell asleep. Hours later, Sherlock Holmes woke up and nudged his friend, Watson, and said, Watson, look up and tell me what you see. Watson opened his eyes and said, I see a fantastic panorama of countless stars. Sherlock Holmes says, and what does that tell you? Watson said, astronomically, that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I can deduce that the time is a quarter past three. Theologically, that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. And then Watson says, why, Sherlock, what does it tell you? And he said, that someone has stolen our tent. Obvious, right? That's, that's the obvious observation. I feel that lots of people do what Watson did when it comes to end times prophecy. They get so elaborate that they miss the immediate. And the immediate is simply this. Be ready. We should be ready. Watch, therefore, Jesus said, and he told us to be ready. I have uh, read uh, about a week or so ago a new research study by Pew Research that said something that got my attention. Uh, it, um, it put out th these statistics, four in ten Americans believe we are living in the end times. Four in ten Americans believe we are living in the end times. Uh, it stated 55%, over half of all Americans say we're in the last days and Jesus is coming back to the earth one day. That's a significantly high rate of people, group of people. Though most will say they don't know what the timing will be, some believe that he will return in their lifetime. Here's what's amazing about that research poll. That's not just a poll of evangelical Christians. That's a poll of Americans of all races and religions and political viewpoints. Which begs the question, why? Why are so many people now, more than ever before, saying, I think we might be living in the last days? Well, look back on 2022. It's been a turbulent year. It's been a turbulent few years. Back in March, Russia invaded Ukraine. 200,000 soldiers have been killed, about 400,000 civilians. So when you have a half a million plus people dying in a war or rumors of war, that gets people's attention. Also, this is now the third year of the pandemic, and the number of COVID deaths have topped 6.6 .6 million. Add to that inflation, not just in our country, inflation around the world has touched virtually every country. And it is especially hitting low and middle class income people. So the name of this message today, this prophecy update, is what will the future hold? What will the future hold? And this message is sort of a, an introduction to something that we'll be looking at 
uh, in a few weeks after we're done with Colossians when we look at a series on eschatology or the end times. Now, the Bible does predict the future. The Bible clearly predicts the future. But I find there are two extremes with people reading the Bible that predicts the future. One extreme is overstatement. The other extreme is understatement. Some overstate it. Some are fanatics about Bible prophecy. It's all they talk about. They build their entire ministry on it. Everything is sensationalized. They see everything as a sign from God, from a Jewish festival to a blood moon to the logo of Starbucks. Everything is a sign from God. The other extreme is understatement, and perhaps understatement is a reaction to, number one, the overstatement, because so many people overstate it, hey, let's just not talk about it. Let's just not deal with it. It seems for some, there is a refusal to deal with the idea of the end times or of prophecy. Um, Partly, it's because of, number one, an overreaction to prophecy. But, but for some who don't talk about it at all, it's partly because they have a theological construct. There's a history of their uh, interpretation that sort of forbids them from doing that. We will go into more depth uh, in our series. Uh, but what's interesting about this particular group that makes the, the understatement of Bible prophecy is that so often this very group is the group that is known for digging deep and championing the great doctrines of the Bible. They're really good at, at uncovering every stone when it comes to the doctrine of grace, salvation, sanctification, the church, soteriology. But when it comes to prophecy, it's like they're an abysmal failure. They don't talk about it. They don't see it. Uh, it's like God is, is unfolding signs right before their eyes, but their head is in the theological sand. We want to we wanna approach this in a balanced way. So today, what I'm going to do, and I'm just going to scratch the surface of this chapter. It's just really a deep uh, section of Scripture. But um, I, I, am, I am going to predict the future today. I'm going to predict the future through the lens of Luke chapter 21, and I'm going to tell you things that will happen. I'm going to give you four certainties about the future. Here's the first. There will be an end. There will be an end. I know I'm starting very general here, right? There will one day be an end, an end of the world. Uh, let's uh, pick it up in verse 7. So they, they being the disciples, asked him, Jesus, saying, Teacher, when will these things be? And what sign will there be that these things are about to take place? And he said to them, Take heed that you do not be deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, because we've always had wars, we've always had commotions. Do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end is or will not come immediately. That's not to say the end will not come, but the end will not come immediately. It will come, definitely, but in God's perfect time. So go down to verse 32. Verse 32, Jesus is talking, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. Notice that. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. One day the world will end. We know that from a biblical perspective. We know that one day the world will come to an end, Jesus said in Matthew 24. Okay, let me pause just for a moment because you're going to hear me refer to this, and this is sort of nuts and bolts. Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21, Mark chapter 13 are all essentially about the same sermon that Jesus gave called the Olivet Discourse. It's a little more detailed in Matthew 24, less so in Luke 21, 
less so in Mark 13 for a host of reasons I'm not going to uncover today. But it's from different vantage points, but same basic territory. So in Matthew 24, the parallel text to this, Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. There's Jesus saying, the end's going to come one day. Paul, the apostle, knew that to be the truth. When he gave us that great chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, about the resurrection of the dead at the coming of Christ, he said, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father and he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. So Jesus said the end is coming. Paul said the end is coming. Peter not only said the end is coming, but he describes the end of the world. 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? The word dissolve in that verse means to unloose or to set free what is bound. The idea is that the elements will be broken up into their component parts, like a building being torn down. The physical structure of the universe will disintegrate. If I could put it like this, the creation will be uncreated. It will be dissolved. Now, we know that from the Bible, but we also know that from the scientific community that regularly reminds us that we live in a limited universe. Uh, we didn't always believe this. Science didn't always teach this, but uh, we have come to the understanding that uh, um, the universe is expanding. We have observed radiation echo, which adds credence to that idea. But did you know, up until the 1950s, and really the 1960s, the scientific community said that the universe is just eternal. It's just going to go on and on and on. It was called the steady state theory. The steady state theory. That was the prevailing cosmology of the day. Today, we know better. We know different. We've added to our knowledge base. And so there's different theories as to how the universe is going to end. But one thing everybody agrees on it's going to end. It's going to end. The universe is running down. There are certain scientific realities that are undeniable and unbreakable. Laws, scientific laws. One of them is the now famous second law of thermodynamics, which basically says everything in the material universe is experiencing energy loss or heat death. It's like a clock that has been wound up that is running down. So this is easily observable. Cars, over time, don't get shinier or more efficient, right? They rust and they break down. Human beings, over time, don't grow stronger as they get really old. They grow weaker. We don't become uh, less wrinklier uh, over time. The second law of thermodynamics, I checked this morning in the mirror, is at work. <laughs> there will be an end. There will be an end. That's one prediction. Second, Jesus will be back. Jesus will be back. In chapter 21, our chapter, verse 27, one sentence. Then, after all these things he talks about, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. The Son of Man is a messianic term, it is, and all the Jews knew that. He was speaking about a reference of Daniel chapter 7, a vision of the Son of Man who, who is given a kingdom. They will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. 
Now, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 24, remember I said that there's three chapters that deal with this Olivet Discourse? Matthew 24, the disciples are walking with Jesus up the Mount of Olives, and they ask him a question. They said, um, not only when will these things be, but what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? In chapter 24 and Luke 21 is the answer to that question. What will be the sign of your coming? Now, isn't that an odd question to ask somebody who's standing there with him? He's already there. And he says, so, when are you coming? You know, you might think Jesus is going to say, did you notice I'm with you guys? <laughs> now, when they asked that question, they did not think of his second coming. You might automatically go, oh, they're, he's, they're mentioning. They didn't know about a second coming. They didn't believe in a second coming. They thought the Messiah is coming. Okay, he has come. He's here. When they said the sign of your coming, they believe he's going to stay there, but there's going to be some punctuating event. That was their eschatology. That was their belief that the Messiah is going to now rule over the enemies of Israel and set up his kingdom. That's what they meant by coming. Some punctuating event, not a return. However, that's what they thought. In a couple days from that question, he takes him up to an upper room where they have the Passover, the Last Supper. And Jesus unloads the truth on them that he is going to die, that he's going to be crucified and then rise again. Now, when they heard that, I am convinced it was like this. Does not compute. <laughs> they did, did not get it at all. But in that conversation, Jesus said to his disciples, because he could tell that they were really bothered by this. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions or rooms or dwellings, literally. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. He says two things. I'm going and I'm coming again. I'm going and I'm coming again. Ever since Jesus spoke that promise, that has been the blessed hope of the church for the last 2,000 years. That's why Paul and Titus 2 called it that. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is why so many of the hymns of the historic Christian church have been about the coming of Christ, the second coming. We sing them at Christmas because we think they're Christmas songs, but they're not. They're second coming songs. One is the Isaac Watts anthem, Joy to the World, the Lord is Come, Let Earth Receive Her King. It's about the second coming. Or the Charles Wesley hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. It's about the second coming. Julia Ward Howe wrote Battle Hymn of the Republic after the Civil War. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. It's about the second coming. And it's because this is one of the dominant themes of Scripture. Did you know that? The second coming of Jesus Christ dominates the Bible next to the subject of faith the coming of Christ in the future is the most discussed topic in the book. You know how many times? 1,845 times. 1,845 times that second coming is alluded to or predicted. That's one out of every 25 verses in the New Testament that mention it. So out of 260 chapters that comprise Matthew to Revelation, there are in the New Testament 318 times the second coming is spoken of. For every one mention of the first coming of Jesus, the second coming is mentioned eight times. So the first coming is pretty important, right? Pretty important. Jesus coming to earth, dying on a cross. We celebrate the first coming every Christmas. Pretty important. Eight times more the second coming. 
For every one time the subject of atonement appears, the second coming is mentioned twice. So it's, it, it's, it's pretty important. So uh, we know two things that we can predict. There will be an end of the world. Jesus will be back. I'll give you a third. Third, there will be signs. There will be signs. You notice the question in verse 7. They asked him, teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be that these things are about to take place? Verse 11. And there will be great earthquakes in various places, famines, pestilences, and there will be frightful signs and great sights and great signs from heaven. Go down to verse 25. And there will be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and on earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Go down to verse 31. So you also, so you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Signs, signs, signals. The Greek word semion, which means markers or indicators or signals. God is a God of signs. He gives indicators when he is about to do something. You know why he does that? Because he wants people to be aware that he's doing something. Hence the sign. Just like you have a road sign. It tells you what is coming ahead. In Amos chapter 3, verse 7, he writes, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. So when God is going to do something, he warns his people. He sends a sign so his people will know that he's going to do something. You remember when the religious leaders came to Jesus and they said, We want a sign from heaven. And Jesus responded to them in his loving tone, hypocrites. And I, I, I don't say that tongue-in-cheek. He was always love incarnate. And even when he unloaded on his enemies, he still spoke that harsh word in love. He said, hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Now, what was he talking about there? His first coming. His first coming, the Messiah. The Messiah came to Israel. They should have seen the signs. Did you know there were signs of his first coming? You know how many signs there were? About 300. About 330 signs. Now, if you're driving down the road and you see 330 signs, you better not be surprised when you end up wherever it says you're going to be ending up at. 300 to 330 signs like, and here's his personal profile in the Old Testament, Messiah will be, be from the tribe of Judah, he'll be born in Bethlehem, he'll be from the lineage of King David, he'll arrive before the temple is destroyed, and others. Now I know that, and we'll talk about this a little more in our series, I know that the last days technically started 2,000 years ago. If you look at all of world history, the last days is from the time of Christ's first coming to the time of his second coming. But I think there is some indication that we could be in like the last days of the last days, the final days of that time period. There are signs the prophets gave. There are signs that Paul gave. There are signs that Jesus gave in Luke 21, Matthew 24, Mark 13, as well as other places. Now, something else. Now, this is sort of nuts and bolts a little bit here. The signs that are mentioned in those three New Testament chapters, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, the signs that Jesus gives are signs that will take place primarily in a future time period called in the Old Testament the 70th week of Daniel. you got to know Daniel 9 to understand that phrase. The 70th week of Daniel, a seven-year future time period the New Testament refers to as the tribulation period. 
And more specifically, it'll be the last three and a half years of that seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation period. So those are the signs that he speaks of. We are not in that time period right now. We are not in that future eschatological time of the tribulation, but it sure seems like we're getting right up to the edge of it. Now something else that will be helpful. In the Matthew 24 rendition of the Olivet Discourse, when Jesus gives the signs, there's going to be this and this and that and watch for this and that, he says this in, I think, Matthew 24, verse 7 or verse 8. The, verse 8, these are the beginning of sorrows, literally birth pains or birth pangs. These are the beginning of birth pains. Now, we know something about birth pains. Women especially know. I mean, I'm just, I have, I have observed them. Uh, but birth pains happen not at the beginning of pregnancy, not in the middle, but they happen right before a birth, hence the term birth pains. So there are contractions that occur, but you know that they're uh, important enough to go to, to the doctor or the hospital or the birthing clinic uh, or the midwife when the birth pains are more frequent and more intense. You can time them, they're regular, and they intensify. So Jesus gave signs, but he said they're like the birth pains of a woman in labor. You know the baby's going to be born because they're more frequent and more intense. So there's a tension, a pain, and then a, relax, uh, a relaxation, a reprieve. And so uh, we, we all have some cataclysm on the earth and then a reprieve. But the closer we get to the very end, the closer we get to that period, the closer and more intense those contractions are going to occur. So look at verse 28. Now when these things, all the things he's been talking about, when these things begin to happen, begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. So let's consider some things that are beginning to happen. What can we look at in our modern world that would be an indication that these things are beginning to happen? Well, let me give you sort of the most obvious one. We'll start at the broadest one, and that is this. Israel is back in their land. That happened May 14th of 1948. That is significant. Prophetically speaking, this I would consider a mega sign Israel is back in the land. Now, why is that important to us? Here's why. The context of these chapters, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, the context of these chapters is Jewish. It's not Baptist. It's not Presbyterian. It's not Calvary Chapel. It's not American. It's Jewish. Jesus talks about Judea. That's a geographic area in Israel. He talks about Jerusalem. That's a city there. He says inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he speaks of the Sabbath day. Pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath. So the context is very, very Jewish. Because of that fact, it necessitates that Israel has to be in their land. So the events he speaks about made sense if they happened then, when he spoke them 2,000 years ago, before 70 AD. They didn't, by the way. They're cataclysmic. Or they have to happen after May 14th, 1948, when Israel is in the land and you have inhabitants of Jerusalem who are worried about the Sabbath day. So the Jews being in their homeland is the first prerequisite. This is why biblical scholars, May 14th, 1948, make such a big deal out of that event. So that's number one. Israel is in their land. Here's, a, here's something else that I think we're seeing. There is a coalition of nations that is forming right now that has prophetic implications. I'm speaking about three nations in particular. Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Russia, Iran, and Turkey. So let me just sort of bring you up to speed. You probably already know this if you have looked at the news. 
to any degree. Uh, in recent years, Vladimir Putin has made no bones about the fact that he wants the reunification of uh, the Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc. He sort of snuck back into Georgia, the Republic of Georgia, not the state of Georgia. Uh, in 2008, he annexed Crimea in 2015, and in March of 2022, he invaded the Ukraine, all according to his grand plan. But did you know he also has an interest in the Middle East. Uh, you may not know that uh, Russia has established a permanent naval base in Syria. The northern part of the port city of Tartus is a Russian naval base, a quite substantive Russian naval base. The Russians helped Iran build their second, second nuclear facility and today, at present, there are 1,000 or so Russian nuclear scientists working in Iran. So they have this interesting relationship, which has, we've never seen it historically. Um, also, the Mossad chief this week, David Barnea, said that Iran has delivered weapons to Russia the past few months and plans to deliver more weapons to Russia in the future. So Russia and Iran are just interesting to watch. But there's a third player I mentioned, and that is Turkey. Turkey is overseen by its president, Erdogan, who was at one time a moderate Muslim. Today, uh, he has been moving quite to the extreme end of being uh, Islamic. In 2017, Turkey signed with Russia a $2.5 billion deal for a state-of-the-art anti-ballistic defense system. So you just have this interesting configuration of Russia and Iran and Turkey. Why is that important? Well, the Bible predicts that in the end of days, there will be a battle fought against Israel by a group of nations who form a coalition. Ezekiel 38 and 39 describe those nations, name those nations. One group is Magog, Rosh, and Meshech. Any historian will tell you that's Russia. They make a coalition with ancient Persia, which is modern-day Iran. And they also make a coalition with the nation of Gomer, which is modern-day Turkey. Russia, Iran, Turkey. It says in the text, they'll form a coalition and they will come against Israel in the last days. So, that presupposes certain conditions. Number one, it presupposes that there will be an, a nation of Israel. May 14th, 1948. Pretty recent. So, the precondition is that Israel has to be present in the land. Not just present in the land, prosperous in the land. Ezekiel 36, God says, I will multiply you. I will do better for you than at your beginnings. So the whole chapter talks about Israeli prosperity. And if you know anything about the GDP of Israel today, it's one of the strongest nations going. Not just present, not just prosperous, but also peaceful. Have you looked at the Middle East in the last hundred years? It's not a peaceful place. It's a rough neighborhood. You've got 411 billion, uh, or 411 million, excuse me, uh, uh, neighbors who want nothing more than the total elimination of the state of Israel, and yet they exist. So Ezekiel 38 describes Israel right before this battle as a peaceful people dwelling securely, dwelling in safety. Which leads me to a third observation of what's going on. Israel is becoming more peaceful. I should really restate that. The region is becoming more peaceful. And that goes against historic norms. Back in uh, 2020, September 15th to be exact of 2020, I was there when it happened. I was on the south lawn of the White House when the Abraham Accords were signed. I know, the media just sort of whitewashed that and, and overlooked it. It is one of the most significant historic things ever to have happened. 
that Israel and Arab nations make peace. I mean, that's like Anwar Sadat, and that's what happened with Jordan years ago. But that day, foreign ministers of the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain signed a peace accord with Israel. Since then, two more Arab countries have followed, Morocco, Sudan. Also since then, Kosovo, though not Arab, but certainly Muslim, has signed on to the Abraham Accords. And most recently, what happened just a few days ago, uh, the Prime Minister was sworn in, Bibi Netanyahu, is now his sixth term as Prime Minister of the Nation of Israel, has stated that he intends to make peace with Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Now think of this. Just think of what happened uh, in September 11th, 2001. And the whole world was looking at Saudi Arabia because that's where the terrorists came from. And certainly they're not making peace with the world. And most definitely they're not making peace with Israel. A diplomat from Israel said just the other day, their intention is to expand the Abraham Accords with Saudi Arabia this coming year. Now why is that even important? Well, first of all, it's what you've been praying for, haven't you? Um, uh, of Psalm 122, for the last couple thousand years, Christians have been praying, as it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Uh, Christians for hundreds of years have been praying that God would bring peace. He is answering their prayer. But second, it's prophetic because, again, a precondition for this war in the last days of Gog and Magog against Israel is regional stability. Now, we know that uh, a leader, a dictator, will come on the scene eventually in this period. We call him the Antichrist, though he's got about 50 different titles. We've just sort of landed on that one. The Antichrist will make a, an agreement, a peace deal with Israel, a seven-year peace agreement. He'll break it in the middle of that seven-year period. He promises to protect them, but then he'll break it. So we can just look at the chessboard. The pieces are all lining up in interesting fashion. And there, there's a fourth thing that I want to look to, a fourth trend, and that is this. The world is being conditioned to government control. The world is being conditioned for government control. Look at verse 11. He gives a, a list of signs. There will be great earthquakes in various places. There always has been earthquakes, um, especially if you live in the West Coast. Uh, famines, pestilences. Ooh, look at that word, pestilences. Um, what was COVID? Would that, would that qualify as a pestilence? If you were to look up in Webster's Dictionary the definition of pestilence, it says, quote, a contagion or infectious epidemic that is virulent and devastating. Now, primarily, again, I want to be responsible here, these are signs that deal specifically with the tribulation period. But COVID sure seemed to be in biblical proportion. It just felt apocalyptic. Uh, it was worldwide. It affected nearly everyone. Uh, and it provided universal government overreach in most every nation where some groups were called essential, some groups, including churches, were called non-essential. The government could now say that. You had to comply with that. And then as we're getting back to our normal routine, you've got to prove that you've been vaccinated or you will not be able to buy or sell. You will not be able to go into that restaurant and eat. You won't be able to do that. I want to share a quote from a, uh, an Israeli historian he teaches at Hebrew University uh, currently. His name is Yuval Harari. He said, and I quote, COVID is what convinced people to accept and to legitimize total biometric surveillance. What a statement. Total biometric surveillance. He goes on, people 
could look back in a hundred years and identify the coronavirus epidemic as the moment when a new regime of surveillance took over, especially surveillance under the skin, which I think is maybe the most important development of the 21st century, is the ability to hack human beings, end quote. You know, for the last couple of thousand years, it just didn't seem possible that the whole world would one day be forced to take a mark. But today, it makes a lot more sense. I know, this doesn't perfectly qualify as a prophetic sign, but it is a precursor to it. I, I certainly now have a better understanding of how the events of the tribulation are going to be able to happen. Because you can motivate entire population bases with one emotion. It's called fear. Get them scared and you can get them to do anything. You can move them in any direction. The world is being conditioned to government control. So there will be an end. Jesus will be back and there will be signs. But I want to end with this. Number four, we will be saved. We will be saved. Doesn't mean that times are not going to get tough. Does not mean that we're not going to experience tribulation in the world. We will. Jesus promised we will. But the great tribulation is completely different. We will be saved. We already are saved. Um, I understand that. But I'm talking about saved from something specific. And in verse 28 again, let's close with this. When these things begin to happen, here's what you're to do. Look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Go down to verse 36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. These things are coming, but pray that you can escape these things that are coming. Now, we live in the church age. This is the age of grace. Currently, God is doing a, a work around the world in getting His church together um, but the church age is going to come to an end. It's going to come to an end suddenly. Suddenly. Jesus said, or uh, the Bible says, it's coming like a thief in the night. Uh, thieves don't text you what time they're arriving. <laughs> right? Uh, they show up suddenly and unexpectedly. So we're living in the church age. The church age will abruptly come to an end. We call it the rapture of the church for a very good reason, by the way. And by the way, we'll deal with the fact that it is a long-standing belief, not a recent belief. Um, but then after that will be a period of Daniel's 70th week, the tribulation period, seven-year period. If you want to know what that's going to be like, you can read Revelation chapters 4 through 19 in great detail. Uh, the events are given of the tribulation period. After that, Jesus will return from heaven with his church. He will quell a rebellion that takes place in the Middle East. He'll establish his kingdom. And there are signs for when that's going to happen. Signs that Jesus speaks about. Signs that Paul reiterates. The signs that we're dealing with are signs of that future period, whereas the rapture is a signless event. Signless event. In other words, it can happen at any time. But future events often cast their shadows before them. Future events often cast their shadows before them. That is, they appear in incipient form, in nascent form, before they, long before they appear in mega form. Here's an example I want to close with. I close with this. We'll put it up on the screen. It's from John Walvoord. He taught here many years ago. He's now in heaven. He said, there's all kinds of signs for Christmas. There are lights everywhere, decorations, Christmas trees, music, even Santa in the mall. But Thanksgiving can sneak up on you. There are no signs for Thanksgiving. The second coming of Christ is like Christmas. It will be preceded by many specific signs that the scripture outlines. The rapture, however, is like Thanksgiving. There are no specific signs for its coming. 
It's fall, and you begin to see the signs of Christmas everywhere, and so you realize Thanksgiving is somewhere around the corner, too. We're starting to see the shadows fall that predict the second coming of Christ. And because of that, we know the rapture is closer than some of us expected. It's right around the corner. It can't be too far away. So all of this to say we should not only be ready, we should be excited. I know that these are fearful things, and if you really want to get scared, um, you can read the book of Revelation. Uh, it will tell you the catastrophic events. Jesus said the worst time in human history will play out on the stage during that last three and a half year time period. But the Bible also says this, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and of a sound mind. So I know Jesus said men's hearts will be failing them from fear and the expectation of what is coming on the earth. But for us, lift up your heads. Your redemption draws near, he said. Pray that you can escape all these things. And so I am looking up and I do pray and believe that I will escape all these things. We live in some very exciting times. And we ought to be equipped and knowledgeable about those times, hence the series that we're going to embark on after we finish this great book of Colossians, which we will in the next few weeks. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, the hope that we have. It's a very different emotion than the fear that the world has. You have not called us to live as fearful people, but as confident, faith-filled sons and daughters of the living God and the King of kings and Lord of lords. You have not given us a spirit of fear, but power. And I pray, Lord, that we would walk in that and, and exercise in that uh, uh, our love for the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Isaac. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church give.